Okay, so the final speaker for today's Revenge of GR session. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I hate to disappoint you, Joe. <laughs> Until fairly recently, I would have given the exact same talk Bob gave, except not as well as he did. But my viewpoint has changed. And um, I do think that boundary unitarity which I'll define a little bit more later, is, is very plausible, and plausible enough certainly to take it seriously and think about it. Why do I think that? Well, it comes from ADS-CFT, which I resisted for a very long time, giving m many of the same exact arguments that Bob gave, and I finally was beaten down. I think the last blow came from Steve Schenker. <laughs> and, uh, so then I just walked around in a daze for a few years and finally came around, pretty much came around after Don Merrill um, formulated a very simple sort of formal argument that from a relativist point of view sort of made complete sense, um, which is that uh, this boundary unitarity just comes from diffeomorphism invariance. So diffeomorphism. And if that's all there was to it, it still would remain in this sort of philosophical realm. But the great thing about the firewall um, discussions is that now there's a lot at stake. Namely, if you can, I mean, no, I, almost nobody believes, I guess, that the firewall is plausible. So I would say firewall is implausible. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong, though? So we hope to learn both about, so this is in quantum gravity. We hope to learn both about something about quantum gravity and something about ADS-CFT um, just by reconciling what we think should be true about both of them, which is that a horizon should be perfectly smooth place and that we should have boundary unitarity. So um, I think we actually know what's wrong with the firewall arguments. I learned it from Don Merrill. Where is Don? I have to look at him. I learned it from Don. Basically, <laughs> everything I learned from Don. And to me, the paradox is now not the firewall paradox, but the paradox is why Don still thinks there's a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm going to tell you why Don should not think there's a paradox anymore. <laughs> OK. So uh, let me start with a picture. Um, so what does this have to do with black holes? So we're going to adopt this ADS-CFT scenario. This is uh, ADS. Stuff is thrown in from the boundary, and a black hole is made, which persists for a while, and then, let's say, evaporates away completely. And while it's there, it's emitting Hawking radiation. So we have pairs. like this coming off that have been so much discussed so far in the workshop. So let's suppose that this right here is the first Hawking quantum to reach the boundary in this whole process. And I'm going to call it, well, we, these have been called B and B tilde. Since it's the first one, I'll put a one on it. And when it reaches the boundary, I'm going to give it its dual name, B1 dual. Okay. So it's something that has a description in this duality, both in the bulk and in the CFT. But right now I want to say that another thing I learned is that as I should be able to think of the CFT and all the observables in the CFT as completely equivalent and this doesn't quite agree with what Bob said, to the asymptotic observable algebra of the full bulk physics, whatever that is. So I'm not biasing that it's local in the bulk. I mean, it's local in the sense that it's at the boundary, but it's not local transverse to the boundary. It's not just supergravity fields. It's whatever the whole shebang is in the bulk. 
but sort of as it registers asymptotically. So I'm going to take that as given in what I'm saying, although I'm not sure how much of what I'm saying depends exactly on that being precisely true. So the story we've heard a lot about is the problem that there's early Hawking radiation. It's coming off. It's all in a mixed state because it's correlated to partners inside the horizon. And the puzzle is how to get it correlated to the late Hawking radiation without breaking the monogamy of entanglement because the late Hawking radiation has to also be entangled with its partners. But this isn't really what boundary unitarity tells us we should even be asking. We should have asked from the time of arrival of the first Hawking quantum, what the hell is it entangled with? Because the state is pure in the CFT the whole time. In other words, this is continuous unitarity. So while this is a lot like an S matrix, you send stuff in, what, what comes out should be related to what goes in by unitary transformation. But more than that, what uh, time evolution should be unitary in the CFT, step by step, continuously. So um, part of the resolution, or maybe even the whole resolution to the puzzle, I think comes by ask, through asking the question, what is B1 star entangled with when it first arrives at the boundary? What do you imagine happening in the boundary? Is it being absorbed into in some external system or reflected off? I mean, you have a, does it matter? Uh, I guess we could absorb it. I'm often told that's a good thing to do to simplify the realm. Um, I don't think that matters for what I'm talking about right now. Because if, I mean, if it reflects off, we'll go back into the black hole. Right. You're right. right. Yeah. So, so to address this question, which involves a black hole, it's useful to first address a different question that doesn't involve a black hole. And so I'll draw that one next to this. Wait, Ted, I didn't understand what the question is. What is B1 dual entangled with? B1 dual means the quantum at the boundary? Yeah, it's the asymptotic observable that corresponds to the uh, asymptotic limit of the first talking quantum to reach the boundary. And you mean, what is the thing that it's maximally? What is, what is purifying it? What's purifying it? Okay. Yeah, who is its what, purifier? What is the answer, not all the other Hawking quanta that are going to arrive later? Well, I'm talking about in this time slice, in the boundary, oh. but how do I account for the purity the of the full the state? Of the oh. So do you agree that the CFT can describe experiment? which is happening at least outside the straight horizon, not just experiment what's happening at the boundary or infinity far away. You can also describe experiment. You are doing mining and so on. Do you agree that CFT can describe all yes. these particles? Yes. Okay. So let's consider a simpler experiment that doesn't involve a black hole, but actually raises a similar question to this. So again, I'll send two particles in or two whatevers, but without making a black hole, and I'll just have them sort of collide over here, let's say. And then one of them reaches the boundary here, and the other one, they're two daughter particles of this process. One of them arrives up here. OK, so I'll call this one one and two. So it could start in a pure state. If these are sent in some very definite, pure, simple product state. After the collision, this particle and this particle are entangled. And if I just have access to this particle, it's in a mixed state. And it arrives at the boundary. And I look at the boundary at this time. And since I have boundary <coughs> unitarity, I know that the full state of the boundary is pure at this time. So even though it looks like this particle is in a mixed state, it must be purified by something. Yes. Why isn't the answer in both of these cases? In the first case, there's a quark gluon plasma that's living at the boundary. So this Hawking particle, which is like some glue ball that's been emitted from that plasma, is, is entangled with the rest of the plasma. And I think the same uh, thing is true here. When you created those mm -hmm. two particles, there's some energy you created in the boundary. There's some stuff in the boundary. And so the boundary already knows about that interior particle. Yeah, I want to talk plasma. about how it knows. This is an important thing. How does it know? What's the form in which it knows? What is it actually entangled with? There's certainly no plasma in this case. There's some state of the boundary. Theory yeah, there's some state, the exactly. I think you want to understand it from the back point of view. Right? What? You want to understand it from the back well, point of view. Well, first, I actually just want to understand it from the boundary point of view. 
but I'm go but I have to. Well, let me go, let me go on. Okay. So um, this is a question which actually was asked a long time ago, not quite exactly, well, basically exactly in this way. The first paper, um, the paper I was reading recently is from '99, Polchinski, Susskind, and Tumbas, looking at sort of not necessarily a collision, but just some shock wave of a gravitonic. It starts in the center and propagates out towards the boundary, or it might be a collision like this. Other people followed up and looked at this, and they asked exactly the question, how do you know in the boundary, there must be some sign that this is going to arrive here, because, because the boundary is evolving unitarily. What is it that exists here that tells you that this is going to arrive at this time? And it's called the precursor. So it was actually understood. It was conjectured. It was studied and quite plausibly understood that what exists here is a funny kind of state of the CFT, which is called precursor, which is a squeeze state of the CFT vacuum, let's say. That was a very weakly coupled toy model. Yeah, right. right. I mean, that's, we don't have one. I'll get to, yeah. So the simple-minded picture of it was that, for the graviton, was that um, the graviton field, the metric field, is dual to the stress energy tensor of the CFT. The stress energy tensor is not a linear. It's a, quite, it's a composite operator in the CFT, so that if you acted in the bulk with a source that generated this graviton, the dual description of that would be to act with something that couples the stress tensor in the boundary. And since the stress tensor is composite, in particular quadratic, if you exponentiate that action and act on the vacuum with it, you'll generate not a single particle state, but an entangled um, state like what you get in expanding cosmology, let's say, when you um, have time-dependent metric or something. And by the way, just as a comment, even if this were a strictly exactly, say this is not a graviton, but a spherically symmetric dilaton pulse, exactly spherically symmetric from the bulk sort of classical description point of view, the precursor state will of course be spherically symmetric, but it's constructed out of ingredients that are very non-spherically symmetric, just the way, let's say, the de Sitter vacuum is exactly de Sitter invariant, but it has enough asymmetry in it to account for everything you see around you. So you need all the degrees of freedom to actually account for, to describe this precursor, even when the thing it's the precursor of looks much simpler than that. Now, as what Evo is saying, it's, not, it's naive to think that you really have put your finger on exactly what or precursor is, and people argue that actually it's not so simple that you can write down this uh, simple squeeze state. But it, what this tells you is that there are some non-local operators in the CFT. People said it must be gauge invariant, must be non-local, so must be a Wilson line, must be decorated Wilson lines, meaning Wilson lines with operators inserted along the way. And then in a recent paper, even I was argued that uh, the line must be very non-smooth, must be a very kinky or fractal Wilson line. But the point is simply this, that there's something, there's some operator, non-local, in the CFT that has the ability to create what evolves into the arrival of that particle. Now, one other point I want to make about it before going on is how much energy does it cost to do that? Because uh, if the stress tensor, um, if in a perturbative calculation, it was shown that the expectation value of the stress tensor of the, in the precursor state is zero. And what that means is that it's actually um, got positive and negative energy in it that cancel. And when that happens in quantum field theory, you have to pay some interest to get the negative energy according to this quantum interest conjecture. And it was shown in that first paper how the interest scales with the n of the large n field theory. And for fixed principle, the interest scales like 1 over n squared. So the interest at fixed principle
is proportional to 1 over n squared. So actually, it's strictly free in the infinite n limit. Strictly free. And, it, and we should just keep in mind that it means that there's some, it, it, it points to a huge amount of freedom in constructing states without paying for it in energy in the CFT. That should be kept in mind. OK. So that's the um, lesson that I'm trying to draw just from this simple scattering experiment. And now it's time to go back to the black hole, I think. Oh, there's one more. Can you explain to us a little better? I, I'm not so familiar with this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so the idea is that in quantum field theory, you can have states that do have locally negative energy density. Actually, this one had zero lowest order perturbative energy density, positive or negative. But still, the point is that there are negative energy fluctuations in quantum field theory, but they always must be balanced, not just balanced, but overbalanced by positive energy. So in the end, it has to be a little bit of overcompensation. At least the, the extra positive is called the interest okay. in some quantum interest conjecture. It might have been Ford and Romans that coined that term, but I'm not certain. And, um, and it was possible just both on uh, quantum field theory grounds to estimate the scaling. And an amazing thing in that paper was they also calculated this gravitationally in the bulk side by looking at the back reaction of this outgoing graviton and calculating how much it affected the total energy of the space time. So this is interesting. And it scaled principle the same way. Pardon? Uh, well, whatever the, oh, I see, yeah, let's see. Principle is the negative energy. What you, what you borrowed, yeah. So it's equal, there's equal, uh, positive and negative principle, and then there's some positive interest. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, actually, one other thing I should say about this non-local, whatever it is, uh, thing that generates these states, it was also discussed, you know, how you would measure this state in the CFT. Because of the, the nature of the state, you could argue that to actually measure which of these states you had, you would have to assemble an apparatus that injected a huge amount of energy. But, or maybe you could do it over an extremely long time and not pay a lot of energy. I don't know about that. But in any case, I'm just trying to say it doesn't matter. The question is not how you would measure this, but just what is there that is entangled with one. So the answer to the question is, one is purified basically by the precursor of two. Okay. Now, uh, Going back to the black hole picture, what, what's different on the two sides? So the question is, what's purifying B1? It's basically got to be the precursor of B1 dual, in a sense, just to be glib about it. It's because one is entangled with two, and it's the precursor of two that purifies one naturally. B1 is entangled with B1 tilde, so the precursor of B1 tilde is. Now, how, how do you figure out what the precursor is? There's this perturbative treatment of map between bulk and boundary fields, which was discussed a lot already. And, and it could be applied in this situation, and it could be applied conceptually over here. But to apply it, you have to sort of pull. There was the pullback, push forward construction. You evolve backwards in time this B1 tilde partner until it sort of gets out to the boundary register it there by the bulk boundary map asymptotically, and then evolve it forward in the CFT. But clearly, because of the blue shift at the horizon, as I try to pull back, and this was also mentioned earlier by both Joe and Lenny, I think, pull back this partner, it's blue shifting against the horizon, and it goes into the Planckian regime. So unlike this problem, which could conceivably, in the bulk picture, be explained just with, say, quantized supergravity. Here, um, necessarily, the bulk story of pulling back probes not just supergravity, but the UV completion of this theory, whatever it is. In fact, that's a good time to point out that Marolf's argument of diffeo invariance in quantum gravity was not saying that you have boundary unitarity for quantum general relativity. It said, 
if there's a quantum gravity theory that is UV complete, that preserves diffeomorphism invariance, and for which the Hamiltonian is a boundary term because of the constraints in the bulk, then it will have boundary unitarity. And the great thing about ADS-CFT is that there is actually concrete evidence that th there is sitting out there a theory that makes sense that um, sort of satisfies that criterion, even if we don't know everything about it yet. So anyway, so the precursor of B1 tilde is there, but it's been processed through the full string theory. Um, that's the UV completion. And I think it's interesting to say this in a different way to make it even more plausible, to turn off the gravity <coughs> and go back to sort of why ADS-CFT was believed to be true or where it came out of in the first place. So let's turn down the coupling constant all the way until we get something like the um, near extremal D-brain scenario, which really ultimately led to ADS-CFT. So let's say we have near extremal uh, D-brain Hawking radiation. I'll put it in quotes. <coughs> So in this scenario where the coupling, co the string coupling constant is going to zero or it's very small. So we don't have a deformed geometry. We have these D brains in flat space time and they have st open string states, open strings on them. And it, the way as a relativist, I thought about it to just think of it the simplest possible way because I didn't know many details. It's just, it's like a big fat atom that has funny orbitals or something. So here's one of the, here's a picture. I'm sorry, Ted, before you go on to the D-brain, I just want to understand, were you already making a statement here that, that there are no firewalls because the, because the interior partner of, say, B1 is simply to be identified with the exterior purification of B1? I'm going to very much get to discuss that, but that will lie at the root of it, but it's more complicated. That raises another puzzle which I have to resolve. Um, so we have these open strings on the D-brain, and if it's strictly extremal, they're all going one way, and there are no collisions, and it's a kind of ground state. And if it's near extremal, then there are some running the other way, and so they can collide with each other. And when they do, they can actually attach their ends and detach from the D-brain and go off as an excitation into the bulk, and that's believe it or not, amazingly corresponds to Hawking radiation. Corresponds quite closely in quantitatively in specific ways. So we have this scenario. Now we want to uh, turn the coupling back up and say, how do we, ex or what, sorry, we have this scenario. We can ask, what is the partner? What is, what is purifier of this Hawking closed string quantum? What it is, is just the rest of the big molecule or whatever that it detached from. Because the whole thing was in a pure state. And so it is entangled with everything it left behind because which particular pair of open strings collided to make it, we're actually in a superposition of those possibilities. And it leaves behind kind of superpositions of holes in the distribution of open string states. And that's what the purifier is of this quantum. Now let's turn the coupling back up and try to follow what does that become in space time? So um, that means we're gonna take the limit where this gets big again, so gravity gets turned on, but we go to very low energy, and this is that Maldesena limit, which led to ADS-CFT in the first place. In that limit, what we have is the we actually get a black hole or a black brain. The, because we're going to our very low energy, we're at very near the horizon of that thing. And that space near the horizon is really big. And it's, in fact, all of ADS. And we're inside of it. And then what we're asking is, what became of this um, purifier? Well, what was it? It was basically variations in the state of the D-brain. So it was like. D brain excitations, and what becomes of those in space time is the question. 
And that's sort of the same thing as asking what's the precursor that corresponds to this partner. And um, we actually had a talk already by David Turton in a specific setting about the space-time description of, um, in I guess it was ADS3 cross something, of D-brain uh, excitations. And the answer really is that the geometric image of this purifier is distributed through the whole geometry. It's not localized in any one place. And in particular, it even has, like in this ADS3 case, it could be, it left an imprint in the asymptotic charges of the whole uh, you know, symmetry algebra at infinity in the ADS3. So it just shows you that the, the story fits together. You should expect that the purifier is there, but in a way that's very hard to recognize. It's certainly nothing local. And it's, yeah, it's global in the space time. OK, so that's, that's part three uh, of the talk. Good. What about firewalls? I didn't number the other ones, but I'll do this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not completely following this last point. If you go back to the small black hole, are you saying that after short time, after a single quantum has been emitted, that the purifier of that quantum is not located near the black hole? No, this is also going to, it is, and it's also located somewhere else. It's located at the black hole, but also somewhere else. Yes, there. this is what I'm going to end up saying, and I'm amazed I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> the holographic principle, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, so what about firewalls? So we have to, to even think about this, we have to think about the bulk Hilbert space. So far, I've been avoiding doing it. So the question concerns the bulk Hilbert space, really have to think about, so we can't postpone that anymore. <coughs> so what's the bulk Hilbert space? All I need to know about it is this thing that's also been written many times. We've got this sort of B representing Hawking quanta to come in the zone, let's say, and their partners and whatever came out earlier, which I'll just write like this, and maybe there are other factors too, but this is the part I need to talk about here. And given the fact that it was expected that the Hawking radiation eventually should be purified, these guys sort of should be purifying each other. And then on the other hand, we say from local physics, these guys should be purifying each other. So we have a conflict with the monogamy, monogamy of entanglement, or we have double purity. Now, I argued, though, here that basically this purification is not right. E is already purified by another factor, which is, let's say, E, e uh, tilde dual. So I would cross this out do it this way. And similarly, when it reaches the boundary, B will be purified by B tilde dual. Although really, that's an oversimplification because everything in the CFT is interacting with everything else. So it's you can't separate uh, them in that simple way. Yes, sorry, so I'm, I'm confused by something. I think of it as a duality. So it's two descriptions of the same system. But right. This is what the next picture is aimed to clarify. Here you have the Hilbert space both in the back and the boundary, if I understand correctly. Um, I guess another way is, are, are you sure that E tells no, the dual? Let you me just go on okay. one more. This, this, this will clarify it, I think. It's exactly the confusion that the, you should have, or that we all have. So let me draw a picture of 
This is supposed to be the boundary, and it's the origin, and I have a horizon here. And I have B tilde and B. And then I have the duals of those, which are a different description, B tilde dual and B dual. <coughs> But I also, like I said earlier, know that I, I can identify the CFT algebra with the asymptotic observable algebra of the bulk. So there's another way to describe these guys, which I'll call B tilde infinity and uh, B infinity. So basically, I'm using here the fact that the algebra at infinity of the bulk is equal to the algebra of the CFT, algebra of observables. Are those things just gravitons? Um, so what? No, no, these they're are just, not, they're not. Right. What, what, is, what are they? I, I didn't understand. It's, well, for instance, we were just discussing what would be B1 tilde dual. That's this precursor of B1, okay. tilde, B1 tilde. So it's something very complicated. Oh, what are the, sorry, what is the B tilde duals then? Wait, wait. Okay, so one at a time, B1 tilde has some corresponding thing which I would call its precursor, which I was calling its precursor in yeah. the CFT. Yeah. It's very complicated, totally non-local. Mm -hmm. That's what, and then taking them all together, I'm just naming them here B tilde dual. It's those very non-local CFT um, descriptions right. of the partners. Right. The inside yeah, part. Yeah, those, those I understand. I'm trying to understand what the ones These guys? to the left are. Yeah. This is just that, according to Merrill, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> we can identify strictly the CFT with the, the algebra of observables in the CFT with the algebra of asymptotic observables of this quantum diffeomorphism invariant theory in the bulk. You mean the algebra of local? Yeah. The, no, certainly not local. So it's complicated. I can't restrict to local. So, but I'm, I'm, it's a many. It's a statement. It's a many. That's what it's called. Yeah. That's in the book. Yeah. Okay. okay so. Yeah. Okay. So. Why is B tilde not part of the ACFT? Why is say it again? This. Yeah, yeah, is B tilde part in an operator in ACFT? Well, good. I'm so glad the tension is building here because <laughs> we obviously need to resolve something looks screwy here, right? It looks like there's too much and the Hilbert space is too big. I have doppelgangers. Every operator has another version in the same Hilbert space, and that's not quantum mechanics, and that doesn't make sense, right? Well, so here's the my proposed resolution to that puzzle. So. How do I have this? What's, what is wrong with this picture, it says here? Okay. <laughs> so it's that H is too big. So how do we make it smaller? The answer, the answer, I shouldn't have erased it just now. The answer goes back to why we believe, or I believe anyway, in boundary unitarity in the first place. Why was I even, why am I even at this meeting? It's because I believe in boundary unitarity. I don't think I would have come to just argue again with all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I believe, and the reason I believe is, you know, like I said, Maroff's argument, Maroff's argument hinges on the fact that the part of the Hamiltonian that's in the bulk is a constraint. It's really the G0 mu Einstein equations. And then put a big hat on it to make it quantum <laughs> mechanics. <laughs> that thing, which generates diffeomorphisms in the bulk, the vanishing of that is the only reason why the Hamiltonian lives at the boundary. And that's the only reason why I believe in boundary unitarity. And therefore, if I'm trying to puzzle out how can this boundary unitarity be consistent with other things I believe? I'd better use this because this is the foundation of the whole argument. And so far, I haven't said a single thing about this. Okay? And very few people in this meeting so far have said anything about this. 
although it's been briefly mentioned. So now I want to say the crucial thing is we have to take into account the constraints, the diffeomorphism constraints. So what do they tell us about the Hilbert space? So the zero, zero component would be the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. And it's supposed to somehow it corresponds to the generator of surface deformations that evolve in time in the bulk. And then the zero I components would be spatial diffeomorphisms on a given slice. And so the time one, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, it's a second order functional <laughs> differential equation in terms of gravitation variables. What we really need to be talking about is the you know, string theory version of it, which I'm presuming exists by the whole, <coughs> the whole setup. So we have to um, impose this. And then the question is, what is this, what is this, how can this resolve the puzzle about this Hilbert space being too big? So then the scenario of this Wheeler-DeWitt equation, for instance, let's do it this way. Wheeler-DeWitt on some wave function is supposed to be zero. So you start with a wave function that lives in some bigger space than the one that's physical. And the physical Hilbert space is supposed to be the kernel of the Wheeler-DeWitt operator. So something like uh, Wheeler-DeWitt projection acting on you know, the pre-physical Hilbert space, H0, is H phys. So when you construct objects that would satisfy, that would lie in here, you start with things that have a lot more in them, and you project out some subspace. And that subspace is not going to be, not going to respect the tensor product structure of the original um, space you started with. And I want to give, because this is difficult to deal with in any detail, and it's abstract, I want to simplify it to a, just a kind of toy model, an analogy with what we're talking about here. So let me just take a break here. And this is item six. Five was there somewhere. <laughs> Quick Five question. was what is wrong with this picture? Quick question, Ted. So you're including a surface term in your Wheeler-DeWitt equation or no? Uh, no. Yeah, I just, I'm talking about the constraints, the bulk constraints. The Hamiltonian has a surface term. But the states or the observable should commute with this. The state should be annihilated. Maybe not annihilated, but at least matrix elements of this should be zero in all physical states. <laughs> So here's my uh, analogy that should really make this clear what I'm getting at with how to deal with a Hilbert space that looks too big but isn't really. So let me consider a system that has four objects, each one with spin j. And this Hilbert space of that's supposed to be H0. So H0 my sort of pre-physical Hilbert space is j times j times j times j. So it's like j to the fourth. Um, now, what's the analog of my Wheeler-DeWitt equation going to be? It'll be the, consist the condition that the states be exactly rotationally invariant. Instead of diffeomorphism invariant, rotation invariant. So constraint will be the total angular momentum operator acting on the state gives zero. This corresponds to rotation and variance. In other words, out of all the states in the Hilbert space, we're only allowed to look at the singlets. So what do those singlets look like? Well, to find them, we have to do addition of angular momenta. And we can do that by, say, grouping these two guys and these two. Or we could group these two and these two, or these two and these two, or we can do it lots of ways. I'll pick one way. Let's say I group these two and these two. Then I have J tensor J, tensor J tensor J. And we know how to do a single one of these factors. We get everything between J minus J and J plus J. So we get a single singlet from here, and a triplet, and a spin 2, and everything up to 2j. And then I have another factor, this is an equals, exactly the same from the second pair.
And now I have to find the singlets in, this, in these products. But you know, from say, the spin two, I can't multiply by anything and get a singlet except the other spin two over here. So for each one, I get a singlet from the zero times zero, one singlet from the one times one, and everything up to 2j. So I get 2j plus one singlets, zero plus, zero sub, sub zero, zero sub one, up to zero sub 2j, um, yeah, plus everything else that's not a singlet. And now when I act with my constraint, I project out the everything else, and all I'm left with is this physical Hilbert space. Now, and what's an observable in this theory is something that commutes with the constraint, so it should be rotationally invariant. So for example, the total spin of this pair is J1 plus J2 squared. That's an observable because it commutes with J, J, the total J. So J12 squared is J1 plus J2 squared. And J12 squared commutes with J, so it's an observable. And in fact, just using the eigenvalues of this observable, or the projections onto the eigen subspaces of this observable, I could tell which one of these singlets I'm talking about, because they came from these guys. But I could just as well have told which of these guys I was coming from by using J3 plus J4 squared. Or in fact, I could have grouped it differently. I could have used two plus three squared. So the point is that the, in this theory, theory quote, the information is distributed in multiple ways throughout the state. It's, it's redundantly encoded into the structure of the state and it can be read out by different, let's call it local measurements. I can measure this. I could also measure the exact same thing in this theory by measuring these two. And so, what I'm, all right, so that's the analogy. And then comes the hypothesis. Which I guess you know what it is. It's this, it works the same way in quantum gravity. In other words, the, the nature of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and the relationship between local quantum field theory in the bulk and its tensor factors of local pieces, plus all the other degrees of freedom we have to take into account. And the thing projected out by the constraints is similar here. So the hypothesis is it's similar in quantum gravity, or what I really mean is string theory, so um, plus. <laughs> so, is, uh, I think that's probably clear, but let me say a little bit more about it. So, what is the nature so, of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation compared to something like the condition that the total angular momentum is zero? As I mentioned, this is a second order functional differential equation. Classically, this is the generator of surface deformations, quantum mechanically, Somehow, what's supposed to be going on, and this has been discussed for decades, is that inside the argument of the wave function is physical variables that describe the internal clock of the system. And this condition, or this condition, is somehow telling you that this wave function depends on its arguments in such a way that things evolve appropriately relative to the internal clock. A problem with that has always been that, of course, this is second order and not first order in functional derivatives. So even if you pick the variable that you're going to call the time, like in cosmology, the scale factor is the simple example of that. Uh, you've got a second order instead of a first order equation. Mm -hmm. Well, here, if you take slices that go after the boundary and agree with the global time on the boundary, uh, then I think you also have a surface term. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's why I asked about the surface. Global time is taking the boundary, infinite boundary degree of freedom as a clock. Mm -hmm. 
If you're right. Well, but, you can, I mean, but here I'm just focusing on the internal deformations. Just okay. the, the well, pure gauge, so to speak. Have, then you don't, then you're just doing different morphisms and you're not, you're not really evolving in time. No, I certainly wouldn't agree with that. I mean, if, if we had a, suppose for just a moment, I don't want to get into this because we'll never get out, but uh, <laughs> if you think about cosmology without any boundary, there should be, people have for years tried to make sense of, and I would say with partial success, the sense in which this equation tells you about time evolution with respect to internal clocks. And that's, that's the kind of thing I mean, just the inside of the bulk evolution. Well, they, and they do, you know, really in calculations of the inflationary spectrum, they do something just like this where you, you know, you're correlating the sure. perturbations with a clock like the input time. Right. right. So, um, but of course we should remember that if you have a differential equation, you don't just get the solution generally, you have to impose boundary conditions. So it's probably the case in this theory that it's not enough to say it's similar in quantum gravity because in this case, I get a unique you know, set of states and that's the end of it. Whereas in this situation, I probably have to say more than just this equation, at least say something that corresponds to boundary conditions. And we know from the example in cosmology that's sort of exactly what leads to something like the de Sitter vacuum as, the orig as a wave function of emerging from the wave function of the universe. Without imposing some boundary condition, you wouldn't select that state. So this reminds me of two things that have been discussed with the firewall, in the firewall context. One is uh, actually Don Page's recent paper, what's it called, Extreme Cosmic Censorship, where he basically is saying that States which, like the unentangled pair, would be singular when traced backwards in time are not actually part, they're just disallowed somehow. He didn't quite say why, although I think he mentioned it might be because of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. It's just you could implement that notion by saying, yeah, that's, that's one of the boundary conditions that tells us which solutions of this equation we're supposed to be looking at. And maybe another one of the boundary conditions, for all I know, is the end state boundary condition of Horowitz and Maldesena. I'm not asserting this. I'm just saying it's, it's clear that some amount of boundary conditions have to be imposed and which ones should be imposed presumably come from the theory or maybe there are various sectors of the theory. So there's just uh, more complication behind that. I don't have too much more to say. Uh, there are two things. Eight and nine. Oh, no, actually, I want a, a little bit of rhetoric first before I move on <laughs> to eight. So the, Steve has uh, talked a lot about radical non-locality being necessary to resolve these puzzles. But not so radical. And non-violent non-locality. And I would say that this thing I'm talking about here this sort of non-locality where the same information is encoded in more than one way in this tensor product space, but the physical subspace can't probe everything in that tensor product, so it's actually okay, is a very interesting form of radical non-locality. And we'll come to it in a second whether it means we're actually giving up something about quantum mechanics by having it. Sir? Maybe there's just something I'm missing here. Are, are, are you, is the claim going to be that the Hamiltonian constraint is somehow proportional to like B tilde star minus B tilde or something? Or B tilde infinity minus B tilde? Uh, yeah, I just haven't, I, I haven't seen how, how, it, how it's going to Yeah, it's going to be that it links them together, yeah, in some way. Now, if you can write down the, how it works, that'll be great. Well, <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. I'm saying that you start with a tensor product of local yeah. factors in, uh, that you would have had in local quantum field theory, but, but then you say, wait a minute, I'm doing quantum gravity. I have to impose this constraint. And at the level of the full non-perturbative theory, that has a radical consequence like what you just said. But, but I mean, I, I couldn't tell whether you're saying, whether you're telling us that's true, or you're asking maybe that could be. It's a hypothesis. Yeah, because so, so, the usual... Hamiltonian that you wrote down there, I think, 
is not proportional to b tilde infinity minus b tilde. Right, but the usual Hamiltonian is in general relativity, yes. and I, we need to do string theory, the string theory version of this. Okay. For the reasons that were just said. Yeah. I'm trying to understand to what extent you're saying what many people call A equals RB, and to what extent, and if so, how do you think the standard objections to that are addressed? I don't, I don't see that yet. So for, for example, I mean, I think if, if you say that B tilde and B are, well, we're going to identify B tilde with something on the outside. Well, B tilde and B have to be in a unique space, but... Um, say B star and B tilde star have to be able to be in many different states so that the information can get out and similar issues. Um, B could be in a pure state, in which case it wouldn't have the vacuum carry some piece from the early radiation back into the black hole and get very confused. Uh, yeah, so far I don't... these objections uh, apply to what you're doing? And if, if not, then I don't think I fully understand what the proposal I cannot... So I think it's not the same... But whether it's immune to those objections, I don't know. It's sort of new. I, my head has been spinning for the past week, listening to talks and trying to read papers on the archive and absorb what everybody's been saying about this. And I certainly did think about whether it's the same or distinct proposal to something like A equals RB. I think it is distinct, but I can't say that it's not going to suffer from similar objections because I haven't actually thought through enough yeah, the consequences of having this kind of yeah. uh, multiple encoding of the same information of it in this way. Right. I, I think it's helpful. I mean, so maybe this is different, and then it's very helpful to distill that out. In other words, th there are a bunch of litmus tests that I think one can sort of try to confront every approach with, and then see how it gets around these yeah. specific. It's very similar to the story of the CC, right? Uh, I, I think the answer you might need is that. In some cases, the Hamiltonian constraint really reduces to you know, B infinity minus B tilde is zero. And in other cases, when you're not in an equilibrium state, when you've made an excitation, it looks slightly different. So in that case, you know, there's something. So, so there has to be some statement about when it looks like that and when it doesn't look like that. I think that's, that may be what. Right, what and certainly all excitation. these different degrees of freedom are involved interacting strongly with each other. So even if it looked like that in some sense, sort of initially, it would mix in a complicated way. In particular, if you made an excitation, then you don't want the vacuum to be, you know, you want to be able to excite the vacuum, yeah. so you want it to look slightly different. Um, right. So actually this, yeah, so point eight is actually pretty much what Raphael just raised. It says here, here's what point eight said. Now, what does that lost in space show? Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Um, so I don't see, so is there danger too much in having this kind of multiple encoding? I'm sure that Raphael will have a paper on, out on that <laughs> by the middle of next week, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to reading. Um, right, but I have one, so I, the short statement I have here is, um, I even have frozen vacuum. I don't see it. Okay. <laughs> well, also, I guess that proves it. <laughs> no, I'm just coming. I, I didn't didn't ignore you. <laughs> I also have this equation, just for what it's worth. <laughs> but anyway, I wasn't going to say it. But <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have. But actually, no, I do want to say one thing about the danger. Um, so it might be necessary, if it does turn out to be too dangerous, to invoke another thing that Don Merrill already figured out about all this, which I would call the unintended consequences of measurement. So Don did a, an, has an interesting paper from 2008 called Holographic Thought Experiments, which was uh, basically asking, you know, how would you measure things in the CFT or in the boundary that corresponded to arrival of signals, let's say, at an earlier or a later time than the time at which you were measuring them. But you should be able to measure them according to the general principles of the setup. He actually wrote down in a kind of simple analysis sort of what you would have to do to measure something at time t that corresponded to the arrival of some pulse at the boundary at a later time. And his conclusion was that um, 
Yeah, basically, you would have two options. You either do the measurement really, really, really slowly, so actually so slowly that it's not really fair to say you measured it at time, at a different time before it arrived or something like that. Or you really measure it, but in the process of making the measurement, you distort the causal structure of the boundary by so much that the statement that you're measuring it before it arrived becomes meaningless okay, so or invalid. The boundary lives on a fixed state. How are you distorting it? Don, how are you distorting it? The protocol to, to measure it using boundary values of bulk observables involve making very precise measurements of the total energy. Okay. Now, if you're measuring something quantum mechanically, you write down some you know, unitary measurement model that involves coupling to that. And as you know, the source, which controls coupling to the total energy, is basically G00 on the boundary. So the protocol, therefore, involves effectively, if you will, uh, making G00 a dynamical variable as part of your measuring apparatus. That's the answer. You don't have to say it in that language. You could equally well say you take the CFT Hamiltonian and add to it a term which happens to be equal to the CFT Hamiltonian times a quantum variable of your external system. Okay, it's a different language that achieves the same result. That's how. It, that's that's what's going on. What you're saying is that you run backward and forward by. by what you're what it's saying is that to do a you can talk about it in the language of measuring the energy and doing projections on it, spectral energy spectral ranges of the energy. Okay? But if you look at what happens for a me unitary measurement model of that process. That's too many words. Very simply, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Measurements in quantum mechanics can be discussed in two different languages. One in terms of projections. Okay? There's a set of projection operations that you can do. Okay. The other language is you can write down a description of a device, an apparatus that interacts with your system and performs the measurement. Okay. Yes, the argument is that the device you need to make that measurement effectively, at least in sort of quantum superpositions, runs the system backwards Good. and forward. Thank you. <laughs> so yes is the answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, can I just stop for a minute? I asked a question earlier and I, I, I nodded my head, but I really didn't understand that. Very simple question. The variables B, I, I don't have my glasses on. That's part of my problem. There are four sets of Bs along that line. Right. right. I think I understood the ones. I think I understood the ones on the far right. Yes. I had a little bit of trouble, again associated with Don, mm -hmm. uh, with the ones to the slight left of the vertical line. May I explain? Are those what? gravitons? No. No. They are push forward pullbacks done entirely oh. in the bulk. Okay, but where is all right, so let me come back. Well this to one right. might be gravitons, right? Just just the Hawking quantum BSD itself. BSD not a BSD, BSD on the right side. side. What? Where is the encoding that you expect to be there, let's say after the page time, in the form of gravitons? Ah, where, where is that in the I don't expect it in the form of gravitons. You don't at all? Personally. Now, okay. Don and I had a several email exchange about whether my position was tenable because he invented a system called AUX in which he was going to suck out the, basically the gravitons or the fields they couple to as soon as they reach the boundary and sequester them in another system. And he was used, trying to argue that by doing that, he could force the gravitons to be self-purifying. I never accepted it. I don't agree with it yet. But given his track record, <laughs> so you are giving. I have one more the, thing. You are giving up the idea, and I have no objection to this. But you're giving up the idea that the black hole, as it radiates, becomes entangled with the distant radiation? And I, yes, I'm saying it's more complicated than that. Fine, fine. But I just want to check that. That the B modes, which remain behind, are not entangled, or at least in the standard simple way, with the Hawking radiation as it goes out. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Although in the end, everything gets entangled with everything, but yeah. So I don't want to try your patience, and I have only one more point that I wanted to make, or one more item, number nine. And that is to say, so far I've only addressed the monogamy or double purity argument for firewalls, and I want to say something about, I guess what you could say in two words, firewall typicality argument of Don and Joe, the recent one that was also much discussed. So I just have, I still don't believe in firewalls. What's wrong with their argument is the question. Here I definitely, unlike everything else, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I think there are three plausible answers, each one of which by itself could be enough to kill their argument. And um, although the third one, I'm a little worried somebody's going to tell me it's not. But anyway, then I still have two left over. <laughs> so uh, firewall typicality. Question mark, and this is Meryl Polchinski. So the first argument against it is the one that uh, Dan Harlow gave. So it's the Harlow objection. And I'll remind you that was basically that the zone and the stretched horizon, can I say it this way, were not decoupled enough to. Um, to protect you from a bad, uh, bad enough misenumeration of the states, to be missing a lot of states, to be incorrectly identifying the typical states. So that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say it's that it's a incorrect identification of typical because of of you know let's say. Um, insufficient decoupling of these modes they were labeling from the rest of the system. So insufficient decoupling. That would be one possible, and it seems like a pretty serious point. So let me ask you the same question I asked Dan. Do you think there's an issue, do you think that this issue is in principle analyzable in effective field theory, or do you think that there is some new stringy holographic ah. coupling that causes the problem? If the former, I claim that Joe and I have addressed it and shown the effect to be minimal. Um, paper. I think that should be addressable in effective field theory, okay. if okay. I understand it. So, let me say one thing, because uh, this Harlow project, the objection seems to be what I said. So <laughs> you will see okay. it on Monday. But uh, 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 it, it there, you can uh, address in some sense in effective field theory. Yeah. Okay. As long as you're putting Second objection would be what I'll call the Wheeler DeWitt objection, hmm. which is basically related to what I just said earlier. Yeah. Namely, so the problem is all these states they're telling us are spanning the Hilbert space of states at a given energy band. They're states which have firewall. That was the whole point of the argument. But that means that, you know, they're states which, when evolved, back, the partners evolved back in time. It becomes singular, and maybe the boundary condition on the, on the Wheeler-DeWitt equation just simply rules them out. So they're not in the physical Hilbert space. They're the wrong states. They're just not the right states to be counting. So basically, it's a misidentification. These states are not in H phys. That's basically the, the objection. We, we, cl we claim to have argued they're in HCFT. Well, then they would be in H phys. Okay, Whew. it's a good thing I have one more argument. <laughs> <laughs> this I would call the spectral objection, just to make it sound really obscure. <laughs> what it is is to go back to the very beginning of the talk. Remember the precursors. And the fact that the interest at fixed principles scaled like 1 over n squared. That means that there are more um, low energy states, or let me put it differently, more ways to vary the energy of a state of some energy than you might have realized. 
And in the large end limit, it takes no energy to do this sort of, um, that is, you, don't have, you can balance positive and negative energy deformations of a state to get the same, a state of the same total energy. So it could be that it's simply, you know, so local. The way they thought about this problem in identifying these states was so local that they just completely missed a bunch of other states that basically are also in that energy band. And the evidence for this, again, is that precursors can be, we, there's evidence that there are precursors that have that cost very little energy and precursor variations that cost very little energy. And therefore, simply that uh, the states are not typical. They're not representative enough. So it's similar to Dan's, but for a different reason. Okay. So the spectral okay. objection is uh, low interest loans, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this should be the speculative objection. Anyway, <laughs> so that's all I have to say about this. Let me and I both younger. <laughs> Lenny and I were both younger and smarter when we wrote that paper, and it's um, it, you know it, it, I think we saw everything that everything in there as being exactly consistent with the usual picture of ADS-CFP, with really a one-to-one -one correspondence between the single phase operators and gravitons and so on. And the winner risk reflects the fact that G Newton is small. I mean, if you, that, that's so that, um, you know, the... I thought you'd say that, but the question we have to do, I think what we have to think about is um, for a black hole of a given mass, how many um, potentially uh, hot pairs are there to create the firewall? What's the density of states? Mm -hmm and whether or not there's enough states being identified at 1 over n interest to escape the conclusion. Why is it relevant? I think that's the quantitative question. I don't understand why this is, is relevant. We didn't try to enumerate all the degrees of freedom or give you what you might call a complete set of fusion operators to name all the states. No, but I thought the way your argument worked was is that you had a good basis for this energy band of states. And for every state in your basis, there was a firewall. You took the expectation value of the uh, we you know, projection into that energy band and you got a firewall. When you say a good basis, what we said is there is one operator that we know which approximately commutes with the Hamiltonian. So it should be diagonalizable within the microcanonical ensemble to good approximation. In some sense, that's giving you a, a, I mean a basis, but it's giving you... The, most of the basis is left murky. It's, if there's a basis labeled by, I don't know, you think there's 17 parameters, we've just told you the last parameter. We didn't care what the first 16 were or how they were labeled. We didn't even care how many extra parameters there are. I see what you mean. Yeah, since, since this also contradicts some claims I've made, I'd just like to comment that independently of the technical uh, arguments that, that show that such a basis exists, I think your arguments, if correct, would also rule out the claim that there exists a basis for the left and right half of the thermal cavity, for the microcanonical ensemble of the thermal cavity, in which, in which I can identify modes on the right half that, that are approximately pure in every, in every basis state. It, it's exactly the same problem, as long as you agree that it's effective field theory describing the zone away from the special horizon. The, the technical problem that you need to solve to establish that, I think, is the same problem. You know, as you were giving this talk, I said, oh, that, that sounds like a really reasonable argument. Um, but in thinking about it, I'm, I'm really confused about the following point. Um, long ago, when I thought about the Willard DeWitt equation, and a number of other people did roughly the same thing, um, if you do, if you think about what's the relationship between quantum field theory and curved space-time and the Wheeler-DeWitt formalism, what you do is you take the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, you take a classical solution of it, the solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi version of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, and then you expand the wave function around that in the standard way, and then you get a Schrodinger equation, and that Schrodinger equation is the equation for all of the states in quantum field theory and curved space-time with this time chosen as some time slicing of the classical solution. 
And there are no more constraints on the states. And so, um, no, I mean, usually when you choose a crop, then this, this component is not local. So if you're gauge fixing to choose a... If you gauge fix on the basis of, of, of a background classical space time, yeah. then, then it's local. No, it's not. I mean, once you can see a gravitational effect. And uh, in cosmology, which is the case where it is explicitly, it's not local. Local up to including graviton degrees of freedom at back. I mean, once you gauge, I mean, if you gauge, I mean, there are two options. Either you gauge fix and consider only the physical degrees of freedom. Wait, there's an issue of how you choose the the um, small gauge transformations for the fluctuations of the gravitons. Right. So if you do that in some covariant fashion, yeah, so the non-positive yeah, definite yes, Hilbert yeah. space, yeah, that's right. you, you then it's that. local. Yeah, then it's local, but then you have uh, a constraint. You still have the VRC constraint, which is the part of manifestation of the of this. I mean, what, what you're saying, what you're saying, gets rid of the second order issue, which is not a big issue. Yeah. Um, but uh, but still, the, the general point that you have this restriction is somehow not. Okay. Um. Okay, so in, in, in quantum gravity, we usually distinguish two things. I mean, you can take the, the Hamiltonian constraint, and if collapse goes to zero at infinity, then you get something we call a constraint, and if collapse goes to one, we get a Hamiltonian. Okay, and that's a Hamiltonian, which is a surface term. You started off talking about boundary unitarity, which is all about the fact that the Hamiltonian can be expressed as a surface term. But then you didn't seem to use that in the rest of your talk, because what you really wanted was the constraint. And it was the constraint which you used to argue that the two points are related. So is that correct? That, that, that I think you never I actually did. moved the time on the boundary. Well, no, I, I think I did at the beginning in terms of insisting on uh, unitarity of the boundary evolution and that there be a purifier of B1 uh, before any other Hawking quanta arrive. And all that was based on the boundary unitarity, which is relates to time evolution with the boundary term in the Hamiltonian. It wasn't until I raised the firewall question where I said, okay, now we're asking a question about the bulk structure, so we have to start talking about how we construct the bulk, what we think of as the bulk Hilbert space and how it relates to local effective field theory. And that's where the constraint came in. Just to be clear, the constraint term you that every observable, even when it's defined in the bulk, actually doesn't exist. You always have to refer to something on the boundary. Otherwise, you cannot define you know, what you want. That, that assertion, if it were true, I'm not sure, but I think it would mean that there are no observables in a closed universe, and that quantum gravity just doesn't make any sense in a closed universe without boundary. Now, maybe that's true, but based on what I've sort of seen, it seems like mm, it probably makes sense. Uh, so. I could imagine that there are observables that don't register on the boundary, <coughs> maybe. And if there are, maybe you know that's a kind of limitation of the duality in ADS CFT duality. Not everything is captured on the boundary. But I'm I don't have an opinion about which way that comes but down. You try to do something here like that. You want to relate the details B with the, the ones at infinity, which sort of suggests that almost every observer has a representative that. Well, I see. Has to be but that's a different active. statement. The, the claim Ted is making is that if there is a bulk observable and if there is a boundary, then there, you can write the bulk observable in terms of the boundary. It doesn't mean that if there, he's not saying that you need the boundary in order to define the bulk observable. But I'm also not going to insist that you don't need it. I mean, maybe for all I know, that is the absolutely the only way to ultimately define it. But again, we have a an example of how we do this kind of thing, at least perturbatively solving the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Long was a pioneer in this, in the context of uh, inflationary cosmology. So Ted, you, you, you briefly mentioned some exchange we had about what happens if you export all these uh, Hawking photons outside the system, and where I tried to convince you that you really did have to have entanglement between the different Bs at different times, even though you want to claim it doesn't exist. I think you stated that you weren't necessarily convinced by, I just wanted to get this straight. 
you're not convinced by my argument, but you don't have an explicit response to it? Is that the short version? No, I actually did have responses, but they fell on deaf ears. <laughs> but no, but I would love to discuss it more. I think it'd be easier in person than it was getting over email. Uh, let me suggest also, since Bob's discussion period was cut short, that we could also direct questions to Bob now. And um, I know Jonathan was like, I didn't say something he'd still like to about it. Um, and yes, yes, it's late, so people can feel the vote. And there was more comments, um, the only comments as are um, having non-unitary theories which must apply to conservation. Yeah, but apparently not for us. Do you want to come up? Do you want to come here in France so that they will? <laughs> <laughs> I just quite thought that would be actually. Uh, that was just a comment that I think you can, you can have so theories which right. destroy information but still yeah. conserve, but still conserve uh, momentum, but still conserve, and still have conservation. And the way you do inertial load, and the way you do it is rather than decohere into um, absolute positions or absolute quantities, you add extra fields, you do extra fields, and you decohere into a relational model. So the quantum mechanical version was would be that you decohere, you destroy information, and you decohere into observables like x1 minus x2, which commutes with the total momentum, and therefore you're able to conserve in that way momentum. So by con by by decohering into kind of these relational degrees of freedom and adding extra degrees of freedom, you're able to conserve. But, but you you claim there's a field theoretic version. Of that. Yeah, there's a field theoretic version. Now I think for I think all, all all the conservation laws are relatively easy to do. Energy I think is harder to do um, for re for just reasons that your your um, evolution law is is in time. And so it's, it's Energy is special compared to all the others, mm -hmm. and so I, so I, I kind of prefer the model of bills more recent, like not the earlier ones where it, where you had everything happening at high energy, but rather the more recent ones where um, you have a bit of a memory, you know, you have a memory. In, so I think for energy you might want to have this memory system, but I think for all the other ones, it's fairly easy to just decohere into relational degrees of freedom. So this is a paper by Benny Resnick and myself from 2007. But even energy you can do if you kind of decohere relative to some clock, if you have, have kind of a clock field in some sense. Does right? this, I'm not sure I like that. Does this imply extra degrees of freedom in some sense? Yeah, you need to, well, you need to, do, not necessarily extra ones, you wouldn't be able to decohere into the, you know, the, uh, kind of position, but it would be maybe the position of a particle relative to the black hole. Just like when we measure, when we make a measurement, we don't measure the position of an object. We measure the position of the object relative to the measuring apparatus, and that commutes with the total momentum. That's why we can measure, I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be able to measure anything, because you can only measure things which commute with... But you imagine you, you have an apparatus far away. I mean, when we talk about conservation mm -hmm. of momentum, we have some apparatus which is fixed, and then some particle in the middle right. that moves, right? Yeah, but you still, your measurement is local. I mean, you know, even though, you, 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 when you do a measurement, you, it's a local interaction. So, in Tom Lenny's model of this, I mean, you have this white noise filling space that the randomly coupling constant in space, and now you want to tie those coupling constants down to be to, to sort of dynamical variables. So, so now there, it's more like having quantum fields instead of noise. And, and will, it, will it actually? Is it clear that now is still incoherent? That it is still it's still non-unitary. Yeah, but you're, yeah, you, it'll still be non unitary. So you're not, these extra degrees of freedom you're adding are not the informational, not the ones that carry away information. You know, so you're still, de you're, you're decohering into kind of blocks. So rather than decohering into, say, position, it's relative position. So the extra degrees of freedom just allow you to conserve momentum, but you still are decohering into blocks of relative momentum, relative position. Like I said, I think for energy, I think I think that's fine for all the other ones. Energy is a bit more complicated, and you can do it, but I think it's better to do it the way Bill suggested. Well, let's see. If the black hole forms and evaporates in some small region of space time, right? Um, then can I go to really very, very, very big regions? 
process and then think of it as a local process, process that will affect uh, uh, physics on very, very big regions. That was Stephen's original suggestion and the one that we followed in the uh, so it doesn't have to be the Planck scale. So, so let's say if black holes don't preserve unitarity for black holes of some size. Right? Mm -hmm. Then you go to much, much, much bigger sizes and you write your effective inferior in those very, very big sizes. Right? Then would uh, their, their story apply? I would have thought so. No, I mean, I, I guess there, there's, in the paper there's no, as far as I can see, there's no, you need to be careful what you mean by locality. And if by locality just mean that you respect causality, that it's Lorenz invariant, then I don't think you have a problem. If by locality you mean, like one of the things that these models do, they create correlations. Mm -hmm. um, but these correlations aren't, don't allow for superluminance. They're just like creating entanglement or something like that. So they, you know, they're, they're strange models. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that, but they don't, so they, you need to be careful what you mean by locality. They will, they will have correlations in them that can be created. But they don't allow for any superluminal signals. So they're the Lorenz invariant models. I mean, examples. So, 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 so Hawking's model was effectively Tevin by operators, which were like, say, the field at a position x, and that is just going to create huge swaths of momentum when you do that because you're effectively decoding at a position x. But if that position x is the position of a particle, say, like the, the I mean, it's wrong to think about the black hole as a particle, but mm -hmm. if you can imagine, you know. If I decode here into the field at the position x, where the position x is the position of the particle now, and that's going to conserve momentum because now it's a relative degree of freedom, and the kick in momentum is going to go to the black hole. So you're going to get the decoherence. But how are you kick describing this particle? Is it a is it a relativistic particle described by a quantum field, or is it some kind of? Well, the, the way I just described it now, it was a, a field coupled to a, a quantum mechanical particle, but you can then Give you, I can give you another model where it is, an, where I make it be two fields. Say. So five. Well, I, so you you, you sent me the the references, so I'll try to read them over the weekend and see what I think. Okay. Um, this is good week. Can you find it? Yeah. 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 Y